Well, thank you very much for that welcome. I appreciate it. Uh, yes, I work for a company called Wipro, which is uh, one of the largest companies that you've never heard of, and I'll tell you more about that towards the end of the talk. But the real reason that uh, Sanjeev asked me to speak here is, uh, well, we've been friends for a very long time. We both worked at IBM a long, long time ago. And uh, I have been the, uh, the president of the Open Source Initiative for the past three years, just finished doing that, converting OSI into a member organization. And I'm very committed to the idea of open source software. Open source software was uh, first conceived as a concept in 1998, 1999. And uh, it had the great merit at that point of being described as a, a really dangerous idea. In 1998, it was described as dangerous, as a cancer on the economy, as something that was going to destroy the world of software and technology. And in 2015, it is the default. 78% of businesses are now operating their business with open source software. That means that if you follow Christensen's uh, life cycle curve for adoption, we're now in the late majority. If you're not using open source software yet, you're part of the late majority. You need to catch up and avoid being in the laggards, which is the phase that comes next. 55% of companies say that open source is more secure for them than proprietary. Not because there's some inherent magic in open source software that makes it more secure, but because Open source software gets fixed faster because all the smart people from other companies that compete with you are also working on it and have an interest in fixing it. So open source software ends up being more secure when there are more eyes looking at it than proprietary software could ever be. But most importantly, 88% uh, of businesses say that they will contribute to open source sometime in the next three years. And this was a finding from this year's uh, uh, Future of Open Source survey that I think is uh, utterly game-changing. People are not just picking up open source software because they want to get uh, a free thing to deploy in their infrastructure in some place that isn't important. They're now picking up open source software for mission-critical tasks and employing staff to work on it and intending to collaborate with the community to keep the software current. Does that describe you? Is your company going to contribute to open source in the next three years? I'd suggest you need to pay very close attention because the rules have changed. Uh, things are not as they were. And these days, open source is everywhere. And I mean everywhere. Everywhere you look, open source software is driving the internet. It is driving the devices that you're using. It is driving your consumer and your business experiences. Uh, think of one of the most proprietary companies you can think of, uh, Apple Computer. When you use their iTunes store, you're using Linux back-end software. Open source is driving the experiences, even if you aren't aware of it. Now, why is that happening? It's happening because open source software has inherent business value. And that business value arises from its ethical and philosophical origins. The origins of open source come from these two guys, um, one who worked on the east coast of the US and one who worked on the west coast of the US. The gentleman with the fine smile is a gentleman called Bill Joy. Uh, Bill created BSD Unix that became Solaris and also became uh, Mac OS X, or the, 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 the kernel of it. Uh, Bill also created the world's most popular open source license, the BSD license. And Bill was a guy, or still is a guy, who really likes to do cool stuff and is very happy for you to share his innovation as long as you don't get in his way. And that's what the BSD license is all about. It's about saying, here's my cool stuff, do what you like with it, just don't bother me. And then the other guy is a gentleman called Richard Stallman. He worked on the uh, US East Coast, he still lives there, and uh, Richard uh, is much more focused on the ethical basis of open source software. In fact, he'd be horrified to hear me calling it open source software. He would call it free software, which are, is a term that I think is confusing for business people and prefer not to use, but it means the same thing as open source software. And uh, what Richard did was Richard codified a set of principles, a set of freedoms that lie at the heart of open source. Those freedoms, just to summarize them for you, and he puts them slightly differently to this, 
They have the freedom to use software for any purpose, the freedom to study the software and understand how it works, the freedom to improve the software so that it better meets your needs or the needs of the people that you care about, and the freedom to share the original and the improved version of the software. And those four freedoms lie at the heart of the business value of open source. It's easy to believe that these ethical rules are nothing to do with business. Because after all, businesses are machines that execute a business plan. They're not people who execute an ethical basis. And yet, these four freedoms lie at the heart of uh, everything that we do with open source software. Now at OSI, we, uh, uh, we created a more pragmatic set of interpretations of those four freedoms. We came up with a set of definitions that help you to know whether an open source license actually delivers on those four freedoms. But the open source definition, which you see here, is actually the same thing as the four freedoms. It is simply a deterministic way of finding out whether a copyright license delivers those four freedoms. Uh, what both of those boil down to is they create a collaborative environment for developers to innovate. Now, when you innovate, the last thing you want is to ask somebody for permission to innovate. And that's the world that you find yourself in when you're in a world of reserved copyright, a world of protected patents, a world of proprietary software. You constantly find yourself having to ask for permission. And the key attribute of open source software is that it is permissionless. It is a world where all the permissions that you need to innovate, to deploy, to run in production, to migrate to another solution, all of those permissions are given to you in advance. So you don't have to ask for permission. Sanjeeva was pointing out to you that all of wso 2 software is licensed under a, a particular OSI-approved license, the Apache Software License, and you can take that software and you can innovate with it. You can do the coolest thing you can imagine, and you don't have to ask Sanjeeva's permission in order to do those things, because you've already got permission to pick the software up and innovate with it. Open source software removes the barriers to innovation, to production use of software, to control of your business environment. It gives you the flexibility that you need to run your business on the software that you're using. And these are the key business values of open source. I'm going to suggest to you that it is important for you to specify open source software first when you're procuring your software. Start from the assumption that you must buy open source software. Because if you don't, you don't have this flexibility. You don't have the permission in advance. Um, it's easy as, uh, this is a photograph I took in New York, uh, looking out over towards New Jersey, and you see the, the cranes of the docks in New Jersey are there in the same position as the Statue of Liberty, wanting you to think that liberty and commerce are the same thing. But they're not. Software freedom is something that has to be uh, actively created through an OSI-approved license. And when your vendor tells you there's a free trial, or they tell you there's a discount on adoption, what they're not telling you is that you have become their slave. And uh, that is the reason that you need open source. All of the new technologies we're seeing coming along now depend on open source in order to happen. Just think about it. You can't do cloud computing effectively without open source software. Well, not unless you become the slave of a single vendor anyway. And the reason for that is because it takes open source to create the scalable environment, to be able to spin up a new instance, to be able to build a flexible stack of software that runs anywhere, to be able to have a container system that doesn't have to do endless licensing checks every time it tries to find a surface to mount the container on. Every time you build a new containerized solution and choose to deploy it on an international cloud, you would just be in licensing hell if it wasn't all built around open source software or if there wasn't a single vendor locking you in and fixing all those things for you on their otherwise enslaving platform. So cloud computing requires open source. You simply can't do it any other way if you want to actually have a, a modicum of freedom left at the end of the process. 
Same with Internet of Things, which is, of course, the fancy new device-oriented name for big data. You, you need to have open source software to make this work. Because there isn't a fixed number of cores for you to count and pay licenses on. And uh, you really can't tell which jurisdiction the devices are in. And you're getting an awful lot of data coming in from somewhere that you need to have a scalable platform to perform analytics. You simply can't do IoT without open source. Or if you try, you end up having to do IoT with a single vendor. So as you're looking at solutions, um, solutions are a little bit like this lighthouse. This lighthouse was in Santa Cruz. It's looking beautiful. The light that's coming out of it is actually the moon behind. Open source is what powers the freedom in all of the things I've been talking about. Let me run you through the reasons why open source delivers you the flexibility that you need for your business. It all comes down to Richard Stallman's four freedoms. First of all, the freedom to use the software for any purpose. Now, every OSI-approved license guarantees you the freedom to use the software for any purpose. It's not conditional. There is no end-user license that you have to complete. You don't have to do software asset management. You can simply download the software and use it for any purpose. And if it has an OSI-approved license on it, you can be guaranteed you can use it without there being any implications for your business. Now, if you take components and incorporate them into other software that you then deliver to customers, that's a different story. But software you use inside your own business that's under an OSA license, you have an unlimited right to use it for any purpose. That means you can be prototype-led instead of specification-led in your deployment. Being prototype-led allows you to have solutions that are a much better fit for your business problems because your prototype will show you the places where your thinking is wrong. Now, of course, uh, your production version will also show you the places where your thinking is wrong, but by then it's too expensive to fix, and so you have to pretend that you meant it to be that way. But with open source software, you can afford to do a prototype-led solution and fail early. The secret of success in ICT is failing as early as possible, preferably before anyone notices. And open source software lets you be prototype-led and fail early and change readily. And it lets you change readily because you can swap in new solutions as your business environment changes. This wonderful architecture that WSO2 has got is full of riches that you don't need. But when you do need them, you can just swap them in and start using them because they're all under an OSI-approved license that gives you the freedom to use. And if you're anything like me, you will then choose to partner with WSO2 because they will have the skills that your business needs to grow and sustain the solution that you've decided to deploy. That's the way things should work. If you work that way, you get to decide who to pay and when. Uh, one of the magic things about open source is that nobody has predetermined your IT budget for next year with open source. If you buy a proprietary solution, I won't mention the company, but there's a big one with an O in its name. Um, their, their approach to your IT budget is they want you to spend 100% of it with them. And they will gradually get there incrementally by offering you new solutions and resetting the prices of the stuff you bought last year and cannot leave and cannot negotiate over price. Now, with an open source solution, because you have this freedom to use for any purpose, you can always negotiate with your vendors. You can always go somewhere else to get the service, support, insight, know-how that is related to WSO2 software. The reason Sanjeeva is so lithe and sexy is because he has to stay nimble because he's doing open source. Second, the freedom to study the software. Now, you may not think you want to study the source code to any open source software, but trust me, you do. Well, actually, you don't want to, but the people who work with you should be able to study the software. Because when you can study the software freely, without needing to be a formal partner, without needing to run through a formal certification course, the market for experts can grow and be more nuanced. 
And uh, when you're using open source software, that market can have a range of different skills in it that are available without a gating factor of a vendor's uh, permission. In, you can grow in-house expertise to any level. You can choose to have in-house all the skills that you need for running the software that you're using in your business. That's how Google works. That's how Facebook works. Neither of those companies buys their infrastructure from anybody. They take open source software, they grow the skills in-house, and they run their unimaginably large infrastructure using in-house skills. They're only able to do that because everybody can teach themselves and learn from the software and become experts and understand the product intimately so they can keep the business running. Just can't do that with proprietary software. There's two reasons you can't do it with proprietary software. First of all, you're not allowed to. And secondly, just when you start getting good at things, the vendor changes the entire strategy and you have to learn something else. Neither of those are good. That's why the third freedom is also very important to you, the freedom to improve the software. Now, again, no CXO wants to change the source code to their off-the-shelf software. You would have to be crazy to do that. Uh, you may be a certain kind of crazy, a, a Google-type crazy or a Facebook-type crazy that builds your own infrastructure and therefore is willing to change everything, but I'm figuring that not very many of you are in that uh, position of being Google crazy and wanting to change the source code to your off-the-shelf software. But what you will want to do is participate in a rich marketplace where there are innovators who compete with each other on features and on price as well as on brand. And that happens in an open source market because there is no way that any vendor is locked in. Any one, now this is bad news I'm afraid Sanjeeva, any one of Sanjeeva's partners can choose to compete with him. Any of us can do it if we want to because we can pick up the source code, we can improve it to suit our customers and we can compete directly. Now we don't do that because Sanjeeva has got excellent skills in the 500 staff that he employs and uh, he's got a great culture and he has got a keenly priced product that works well for his customers. But in theory, anybody could do that. There's a rich marketplace for open source software out there. There are no barriers to innovation and most importantly, there is a built-in escrow. What I mean by built-in escrow is that if your vendor does choose to change direction, you can simply find a different supplier to keep the same software running. Um, part of my sordid, guilty history, I ran the open source division of Sun Microsystems. And I released uh, Java and Solaris and Sun's Enterprise Middleware and everything else apart from the Spark compiler under an open source license. And that's meant that as Oracle has purchased Sun, Sun's customers have not had to migrate inexorably to Oracle's products that they had previously chosen not to buy. Instead, they've been able to find alternative providers who support the existing software. And there are some extremely large companies, some based here in London, who have been able to smoothly and seamlessly migrate to a new service and support provider who continues to improve the software that we released at Sun because it was open source. It provides you with an escrow. If it's important enough to you to keep on paying big bucks to get service support and development, somebody will step up to the mark and carry on doing it. And that is straightening and that is challenging for the vendors who follow an open source path. And that's why I have massive respect for WSO2 in sticking so firmly to the open source line that they stick to because they, they are indeed licensing everything under the Apache license, one of the uh, least uh, troublesome open source licenses there is. They are indeed making all their know-how available to you without charge if you choose to use it that way. They are relying on you realizing that you need them rather than that you must have them. And then finally, the freedom to share the software. That lets you deploy without barriers. Uh, do you ever wonder whether your employees can take software home? Have you ever wondered whether the licensing on your desktop software is actually valid at home? Uh, some of the software that uh, uh, in previous companies where I've worked, the software that came on the laptops was actually not authorized for use in the office. Uh, you could only use this thing that was actually called Office at home, and if you used it in the office, you had to have a different license. 
Open source solves all of these problems for you by letting you deploy without barriers. It lets you give the software to anyone you want. Uh, you can give the software to your employees, you can give the software to your partners, you can uh, split your company into operating units that are different legal entities and not have to worry about the licensing transfer between the units. You can run on cloud without having to worry about the licensing implications of the cloud that you're running on being in Luxembourg rather than in London. All of these things are delivered to you by open source software. You can deploy without barriers, and you're, you can develop partner and supplier ecosystems without necessarily having a lawyer on the team every time you try and do something. And that means that you can have citizens and customers using the same software. You can afford to have architectures that have stuff that runs on other people's computers. Pretty radical. This is the future. It's just not evenly distributed. It's just the 78% of people with open source who are living in that future. So that's why I'd summarize for you and tell you that, the, that uh, uh, software freedom is a key attribute. And although you may not think you care about it, its first derivative is something that you do care about. Everything you care about in your business that delivers the flexibility to operate your infrastructure and your IT systems arises as a result of that software freedom. And that's why it's desperately important that you um, choose to uh, uh, specify open source software whenever you're engaging in a procurement activity. If you don't specify open source software, if you buy just on function, there is an unspoken set of extra capabilities that you're unexpectedly getting. Um, it turns out that flexibility is the origin of the values of open source software. And when you buy proprietary, you're not getting that flexibility. That flexibility only comes with the permission of your suppliers. That flexibility only comes as a result in signing away your rights. Um, open source software arises from a community-enabling ethic. And that community-enabling ethic is one that allows people to come in and contribute to the software. It means you can contribute to the software as well if you wish. And both of those depend on uh, an environment where permission is granted in advance. That environment where permission is granted in advance is key. So if you decide that you're going to, uh, specify, not going to specify open source, if you decide you're just going to buy on function and not ask whether the software freedoms are present, then you will miss out on making the savings. Because if you focus on flexibility, you make savings too. Over time, because you're in control of your budget each year, because you are able to specify which vendor you purchase from, how much you pay them, because you've still not got negotiating leverage, when you pay them, all of those things are still under your control, you will make savings. But you shouldn't focus on the savings primarily. You should focus on the flexibility primarily. Because if you focus on the savings, vendors who can lock you in will get you trapped. They'll let you make a saving during your deployment cycle. They'll let you make a saving during your first two years. Maybe you don't care. Maybe you'll have moved on from your job, and that sucker who comes in after you can deal with the lock-in and the sundown for the project. But I suggest you should care. I suggest that you should focus on the flexibility and freedom and ensure that open source is specified when you procure. In fact, I would go further than that. I would say that if we didn't know better, we would pay extra for open source software. We've been kind of mm, seduced by a word, free. And as people with English as a first language, when we hear the word free, we tend to think that we won't have to pay. It's not like the word libra that gets used in other parts of the uh, vaguely Latin-related language world. When you talk about something being libra, you understand that it's about freedoms, it's about liberty. And the word free can mean liberty as well, but primarily it means getting something for nothing. And because we're trapped in that frame of free, we think open source software ought to be cheaper. But I'd suggest to you it should be more expensive because it delivers you control over your budget. It delivers you an energizing flexibility and liberty for your implementers and for your architects. It delivers you control over your destiny. And when you buy proprietary software, you have to cede all of those things to your supplier. You have to give your supplier control over your architecture. 
you have to give away your ability to negotiate over price for your service and support in a few years' time. Because you're hardly going to leave, are you? Because the exit costs, the unspoken exit costs that were there implied at the original prototyping stage, they will make it impossible for you to leave. So now just a, a brief word about community. Uh, community is a very important concept behind open source. Open source software was never actually meant to, to really uh, save anyone any money. Open source software was simply an alternative approach for a community of people to come together and be able to collaborate around a core of software. And open source software is the, is the part of everyone's infrastructure that overlaps. An open source project is the, over, is the unifying, overlapping set of everybody's infrastructure. And because it's that, we all collaborate over it at our own expense to keep it up and running. Now, if you have an attitude that says that you will simply take from that green circle, you're actually always going to be in a position where other people are setting the agenda, where other people are saying what you should do next, which features should be implemented, what the release cycle should be. And so that's the reason why 88% of businesses have said that they're going to be contributing to open source in the future. The reason for that is because uh, if you don't contribute, then you will have to maintain a fork. You'll have to maintain your own version. You'll be responsible for regression on the software that you improve that open source software with. If you take one of Sanjeeva's products and you create your own in-house version, which you're free to do, you will discover that reapplying your innovations on the next version that WSO2 releases is very costly. You'll have to have people who know how to not only do the thing that you innovated, but also how to make it work in a new environment that you haven't become aware of before. And that's why people gradually wise up to the fact that it's important to contribute, because if you don't, you pay forever. Community is probably the most important part of your cost-saving strategy for your ICT infrastructure. And if you contribute, then you will remain flexible. If you fail to contribute, well, then you're going to have to always remain prey for those who do. Now, not everyone wants to join in with the community, and so this is the place where it's important to have a strong partner. And the open source ecosystem is different to the world of proprietary software. Partners in the open source world are places to uh, secure skills from the community to implement. They're not uh, places to, uh, to subcontract a small piece of work and hand you back to the vendor. They're places that can be long-term partners with you. So that's the reason why Sanjeeva is so confident about growing his business. He's, he's told me that um, he wants to grow his business for at least the next 10 years uh, because that's the time it will take to carry on growing at a responsible pace while being a partner with all his customers. He doesn't have his customers locked in. He can't suddenly increase the price in 2017 and then cash out in a quick sale to a, a, a third party. What he instead is going to have to do is keep on innovating, keep on partnering, keep on serving. And that's what's different in the open source ecosystem. Your suppliers will be partners. They won't be predators. And uh, that's also true about the company that I'm working for. The company that I work for is called Wipro. Um, I, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Wipro. Wipro has uh, 150,000 staff in 175 cities across six continents. Um, six out of the top ten banks in the U.S. Uh, are using our services. Um, four out of five of, uh, of uh, global telecoms equipment providers are relying on us. Uh, three out of five oil companies rely on us. We're really quite a big company. Uh, you may not realize that when you look at what we're doing, but um, we are everywhere running all the systems that you want, and it's our open source skills that are doing that. If you need somebody to join the community for you, somebody who, to bring together the know-how to integrate WSO2 solutions into your business, along with the other parts that they need to touch, then a company like ours 
is your ideal partner. And we want to be your partner. We don't want to swoop in, be predatory, and swoop out again. We want to become a long-term partner, joining the community for you and helping you to build sustainable, cost-effective solutions that are best of breed. So that's the reason I'm at this conference, and the reason that, that Wipro hired me was to help them grow this open source business. We've brought our open source team here, we're just outside that door, and we would love to talk to you about how Wipro can help make you successful with WSO2 software. So to summarize for you, the business value of open source, what is the business value of open source? Is it free stuff? Is it celebrating Richard Stallman's GPL? Is it buying Linux format magazine every month? It's none of those things. Business value of open source is the re-empowerment of the CXO. I am part of the, the CIO liberation front. For too long, brothers and sisters, we have been slaves to the vendors who would set our budgets year after year without consulting us. And it's time for it to end. We need control handed back. And the business value of open source is it puts us back in control of our long-term budget and back in control of our overall architecture. It casts out the slave makers in those vendors who would make us their prey. And uh, open source software also re-energizes the developer. It brings flexibility that means that there are more options from more sources and that there is less legal burden from using them because OSI has checked the licenses in advance to make sure they deliver on those four freedoms. And having more options from more sources means that you are in control of an architecture which otherwise you would have to delegate to somebody else. Both of those business values benefit from suppliers who are committed to your software freedom. And you must specify software freedom first. You've, you really have to say in your procurement cycles, is it open source? And if it's not, what's the discount? Because open source should cost more. Open source has got these extra features. It's got the freedom to use for any purpose without asking for permission. It's got the freedom to study the code and work out how it works. It's got the freedom to hire engineers to work on your infrastructure. It's got the freedom to give the software to anyone you want. You go ask Microsoft or Oracle or IBM for those four freedoms on the software they're trying to tell you, sell you and see what they do. It will be like a, a dog hearing a strange noise first. <laughs> and then the subject will change as fast as a fast thing. So the business value of open source is that it puts you back in the driving seat. And I think you've come to the right place for the next couple of days to find out how to do that across your infrastructure and with a great set of partners. Do come and speak to us outside, and uh, thank you very much indeed for your time listening to me.